Hi, I'm Sarah Kalman with City TV. Welcome to this edition of Inside Santa Barbara, the city's only news magazine show. We keep you up to date on the city's most significant issues, projects, and events. It's been talked about for years, closing State Street to vehicular traffic and making it a pedestrian-friendly promenade. Since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, State Street has slowly transformed to the active, vibrant street many were hoping for. Yet, there's still a lot to get done. And how does one go about designing such a large area? That's where the recent design charrette held by local architects comes into play. Welcome everybody to the uh, AIASB Design Charrette 2020. A charrette is where stakeholders come together to collaborate on a design problem. It harnesses the talents and energies of all to look at the problem, provide input and focus on the goal of solving that particular problem. The Santa Barbara chapter of American Institute of Architects conducted a 2020 design charrette for downtown. This charrette involved over 150 volunteers that included architects, landscape architects, planners, engineers, and other interested parties. It's so important for the city to be involved in the State Street design charrette process because great information really comes out of the collaborative process like a charrette. And there is seldom an opportunity like this to get ideas in the creative minds of over 150 architects in one place focused on one area of our city. Design is is critical uh, element, and without it, uh, you can imagine that if you don't have the design part, then you may be spending more than you should, and you may not get as much as you would like. So I can't overemphasize the importance of design, careful design, um, and good design. The COVID-19 pandemic created unique challenges to the charrette meetings. Charrettes are usually done in one day with everyone getting together, but that wasn't possible this time. Remarkably, the charrette meetings were done virtually. This one was over a long period of time because of COVID, and, um, and so they've had to stretch the, everything out. So uh, because of that, there's actually been a huge amount of additional time put into this, and there's been a, an amazing quality of work that's been done as well. The charrettes are very near and dear to my heart, and I think it's one of the most relevant things that AIA does uh, with respect to our community and really helps us as architects um, share what we do with the community towards um, you know, solutions that the city might choose to take on policy-wise. City Council has directed the Community Development Department to change policy and standards for multi-unit housing across the city, including downtown. The changes are needed to create more housing opportunities of all sizes and varieties and all income levels, so we can help facilitate lessening the housing imbalance that currently exists. We received from the State Street Charette process some great building designs on blocks on either side of State Street from the underpass up to the 900 block. These buildings had real data on how many units we could get in that building size and in the downtown area. As you and most people are aware in this city, we are really in a housing crisis and having this data will help us inform future changes to standards for larger apartment and condo buildings in the downtown area. We need to focus the sort of higher density housing opportunities in our downtown area. There are a lot of underutilized, underdeveloped sites. There are city owned parking lots that are just single level on the ground parking lots that could easily um, be developed with housing uh, and also obviously provide uh, parking that's needed. Uh, and uh, so what I see is we have very strong um, architectural design standards for a downtown and those standards have served us really well to create a beautiful downtown and to continue to allow that to evolve. If we have people living and working in downtown then it's automatically a, a vital area. It's when they don't live, if nobody lives downtown they just come down to go to the store and then they get in their car and drive home then we have an unsustainable community. The AIA charrette, in collaboration with the City Planning Division, was designed to illustrate solutions to the downtown area if housing were here. 
Having housing downtown will support the commercial aspect of State Street in terms of expanding types of businesses that will be relevant and important to more of a neighborhood vibe. How traditional cities flourish, um, it's usually with public zones on the, on the ground floor with um, more residential and private above. So I think that makes a lot of sense for this um, city. Part of it is how to do it now, especially with existing historic structures and how that gets worked into. But um, I, th I don't think it's as, as, and I think this charrette has shown, it's not as hard a problem as we think. Um, and so the, a lot of the teams came up with very good examples that are actually very traditional in their, lang in their, in their approach in terms of a, of a beautiful traditional city of having that more public zone on the bottom floor and then having more private above. Close down State Street and make it a pedestrian pro promenade. It's so much more friendly and uh, you bump into people and interact with people and then you also not only that you're not only just going up and down state street you're discovering some of these side neighborhoods like this where we are right now this incredibly beautiful spot uh, if people are on foot they will tend to wander down and so there's you know the funk zone is a, a great place to discover the presidio neighborhood where we are now uh, the arts district the haley corridor that we were discovering all these little sub neighborhoods Adding housing is essential for the vitalization of downtown, but how do we keep the historic architecture and charm? One possibility is to look to Santa Barbara's past designs. Just walk into the David Gebhard room at the city's community development building. The walls have architectural design elevations of State Street from the 1920s. These elevations proposed a bigger and denser downtown than what we have today. We can actually use the his historic guides that we already have built into the city um, as a way of um, adding what, what we need to solve for now, which is additional housing. We can make it happen here in Santa Barbara, create an environment that not only nurtures and enhances, but sustains the vitality of our downtown and the beauty of our downtown, uh, all the architectural character. Uh, and enhance that and make it available for people to enjoy long into the future. The revitalization of downtown isn't just about the buildings and the design of the street. It's also about environmental well-being. Landscaping will play a crucial role by helping to clean stormwater of urban pollutants. We're using plants in certain areas to filter, filter the dirtier water, and those are the opportunities we see. And most people in the design charrette really saw an expansion of landscape. Where could we have a little bit more landscaping? And I, uh, some of us look at it saying, well, whatever landscaping we add should be environmentally beneficial. We should uh, pick those plants that are not only drought tolerant, but plants that can help clean that, that storm water. People overwhelmingly want State Street to become a space for pedestrians and bicyclists, for performances and public art, and all kinds of civic activities. The new design of downtown needs to be creative, and something new and different, but blends well meshing the old and new. Historic and traditional architects all throughout time, uh, it's always been innovation and creativity. And you look at Michelangelo and how, what his Italian Renaissance architecture is like, um, compared to all of his predecessors, and you know if you know Michelangelo architecture enough, pretty quickly you can spot out, oh, that doorway is by Mark Michelangelo. He likes to play with elements a certain way. He has his own sort of somewhat style, but at the same time, it all ties together. It's all Italian Renaissance. It all has the language and um, and different. There's different creative expressions of it, um, and so I think creativity and innovation should really be thought of in that way: as how can we create and innovate within a framework that makes it better of than what it is, not just different. <laughs> The arts are so, so important. They are the root, you know, everything. When I first came to Santa Barbara over 30 years ago, I came here because it was such a beautiful city and it was a classic pattern. And it was full of art and really unusual, interesting art. So we are a town, in my mind, we are a town of incredible artists. You can definitely put public art within a landscaped area. You could use low-lying landscape to surround and give context to a piece of public art. Additionally, other departments in the city are using the information that the Charette gathered on State Street to do increasing um, improvements to 
the look and feel of State Street as no longer car centric, but as pedestrian and cycle centric. You, you know, again, with other things like the rideshare bicycles, and I just think, you know, the more activity, the better. And, and for all different uh, age groups and demographics and visitors and locals. More affordable housing, pedestrian promenade, innovative and creative. These are all just a few things that people hope will make State Street a vibrant place to live, work, and play. Um, essentially, it turns downtown from more of a purely retail um, tourist to perhaps something more like a neighborhood. Uh, we'll see more beautiful buildings developed on some of these opportunity sites, and we may see some even existing buildings that are no longer needed for commercial uses or office uses be converted into housing. And so the more that we can um, look to the past and look to the future at the same time to understand that it was the creativity of those, those former um, designers and architects that gave us what we love so much now, let's move forward into the future and see what kind of creativity our designers and architects of today will give while also respecting and enhancing what we currently have. No one knows for sure what the future of State Street will be, but the AIA Design Charette is a great start to a beautiful road ahead. We're currently in the first steps of creating a vision statement that will define the future of downtown State Street. The AIA Design Charette helps illustrate what a new vision of State Street may look like. According to the Homelessness Policy Research Institute, homelessness in the state of California is up 22% in the past decade, making it a growing problem. See how the city of Santa Barbara is tackling the issue. Every Thursday in Alameda Park from 2 to 7 p.m., something very special is happening. It's called a Neighborhood Navigation Center. This concept brings together different homeless service providers to help enrich their missions bringing services directly to people. So whether we're talking about clothing or doctors without walls or showers, how do we build a holistic kind of continuum so that people can have their immediate needs met and then be connected to long-term solutions like case management, mental health appointments, hospitals, those kind of things. So what we're trying to do is prove that point here and then um, kind of multiply, replicate this. Walking through Alameda Park, you will see multiple organizations busily working to set up their services, covering all the bases needed for people who are experiencing homelessness. Among all these organizations and people, you will see some Westmont College students walking around and passing out food and engaging in conversations with people. Um, today, I just came down to see a couple of old faces, um, hand out just some waters and some bars. We had extras from the other night. Um, there's never really a big mission, if you will, in any time that I come down to the park. Usually it's just to hang out with friends. There are a total of 17 partners. A few of these are Westmont College, City Net, Doctors Without Walls, Showers of Blessing, Care for Paws, and Adam's Angels. Fueling the good work of these service providers are volunteers of all sorts, even neighbors who live a few blocks away from the park. So the group here is Adam's Angels. Uh, Adam McKaig is the founder, he's a realtor in town. And basically when the pandemic started, his business was deemed kind of non-essential. So he was left with time on his hands and saw a need. A lot of facilities and organizations that traditionally help the homeless population in town were either in shutdown mode or just unavailable for a variety of reasons. So he started delivering groceries to people who were like shut-ins and whatnot and saw a need for this particular community and, and the need for <clears throat> clothing and toiletries and, and kind of basic essentials, blankets and sleeping bags. So we started on, on the block over there, uh, next block over, and I found the group initially just, I lived like three blocks that way and happened to be walking by and I asked what they were up to. This is probably late April of last year and I wound up sticking around to help that afternoon and I've been here basically every week since. Uh, and then the the group has expanded from not only the clothing that we do every Thursday, like we're doing right now, uh, we also bag groceries on Monday nights and then distribute those bags of groceries throughout the community to different uh, shelters and different, we've kind of collaborated with other groups like Showers of Blessing, which is a portable shower service. 
and we'll drop off 30 bags of groceries there and just make, making sure that people have enough to eat as well as clothing and things to keep dry. With people's lives on hold during the pandemic, many have had some time on their hands that left them feeling motivated to make a difference, like Adam McCaig, who founded Adam's Angels, a program that came about around the beginning of the pandemic that is now a part of the Neighborhood Navigation Center. We're here with uh, you know, Doctors Without Walls. Uh, we have Care for Paws that uh, meets over there, so we're like a one-stop shop on Thursdays. Uh, we do go to seven different locations from Carpinteria to Isla Vista throughout the week to give uh, food, um, non-perishables, and uh, clothing to our homeless guests in, in this part of the county. During our time in the park, we got a chance to meet Courtney Klein, who's had first-hand experience receiving the services offered by these organizations. There's doctors from the different clinics that are out here volunteering their time to work out here. And it's just a way for everybody to get the health care they need. Doctors Without Walls is an organization that is a part of the continuum of care available at the Neighborhood Navigation Center. It was started 16 years ago in 2005 with the mission to provide medical services to those in need. So in the beginning, there were five of us. And we all took off out of Pershing Park down along the beach. And we ended up at the end of the wharf and we looked at each other and we said, what the heck are we doing? We have no idea what we're doing. And in that first year, we served 352 people. In 2020, we served 4,603 people with individual services from hospitality items to conversation to medical help. We don't find them, they find us. The word has spread. We've learned that by showing up at the same place at the same time and being consistent, whether it's raining, whether it's a holiday, we are there. Our teams are there. They have come to depend on us. They know that even if it's just for a vital check, that they're still alive, that their heart is still beating, that their blood pressure is okay, that we're there to help them. This has been our success story. It's always being there and, and never diverting. And that's the thing that we're pushing on this Neighborhood Navigation Center. We're, we're talking about showing up on the same night at the same time with the same services. So there's a continuum of services. This is what is so critical with this population. You cannot expect them to go all the way out to public health on Del Remedio, take a bus, leave their shopping cart full of things and access our public health system. We learned that early on. We are their public health system. Because of the Neighborhood Navigation Center, Doctors Without Walls is able to be more accessible to those most in need because it is an established location people can depend on. They don't have to choose one service over another based on times and locations. They have a one-stop shop to get everything they need. They have the Showers of Blessings, which goes to, is about five days a week. There are about four different sites, even, and one site is twice a week, Mondays and Fridays but the others are only once a week. And the homeless can get a hot shower and it's been going on down here in Santa Barbara for about five years now. For a year, it was only out in the Isla Vista area, but it was started by a pastor in the, in the Goleta area who just went and asked the homeless, what do you really need? What are the major things that are needed? And they basically told, them that they, they wanted something to do. They wanted someone to realize what was needed for them and they wanted to be able to be cleaned up. So the Showers offers a couple of those items by giving the homeless a chance to volunteer and work with the Showers to gain experience and feel useful. And it makes them feel better once they come out and have had a hot shower and can put on clean clothes. There's donations of underwear, brand new underwear and Towels are washed constantly by volunteers. And people just feel better after getting cleaned up and knowing that they're wanted and have someone to talk to if, they have, if they're having a bad day. Wade Volk, a point person for Showers of Blessings who makes sure the organization runs successfully, is actually someone who previously in his life had benefited from their services. I actually was... Uh, a shower guest at one time, initially when they first came to Santa Barbara five years ago. Um, I was couch surfing and um, it looked like a good opportunity where I wouldn't have to inconvenience, you know, the, the, the person that I was a guest with. 
And so uh, then I, I, in, I volunteered right away and became almost overnight involved with the project. So for over five years, I've been involved in one way, shape or form. Showers of Blessings plays a crucial role in the process of getting people off the streets because many people depend on them to look presentable for their jobs in which Showers of Blessings helps them get. Uh, the showers uh, not only restores human dignity, it transforms lives. So we have two people right now that um, have been experienced homelessness and now are in temporary housing and working for us as a wage. Providing simple showers and basic toiletries are crucial details that people need to start their journey from homelessness. Everybody gets a clean pair, a new pair of underwear, a new pair of socks, and a, we've got donors that just provide those year after year. Everybody gets a meal that's provided in different ways from different organizations and volunteers. Everybody gets toiletries and and uh, just, you know and and things that they need just for personal care and services. We usually have somebody from one of the services, like, you know, that's connected with ACT, that comes and talks to people, that with the, there's almost always a nurse here checking in with people. So there's services and this, that collegiality, just talking to people and, and getting clean. Circling back to our conversations with Courtney, someone who has overcome homelessness, is proof of how effective all these organizations can be when they all collaborate. By working together, more people can be helped in an efficient manner that hasn't been seen before in Santa Barbara. The showers, I've worked with um, SB Act and um, the Doctors Without Walls. I've worked with just about every other group here in the park and they all know me and it's like anybody would give a recommendation for, for me. Through formalizing partnerships amongst different services, the Neighborhood Navigation Center strengthens coordination and outreach to reduce impacts of homelessness and enrich lives by providing tools people need. In our next segment, see how the Creeks Division and Parks and Recreation Department are working together to treat stormwater on the west side while bringing some major improvements to Bonet Park. The Santa Barbara Creeks Division is always looking for new ways to improve the water quality in our creeks. Their latest project, the Bonnet Park Stormwater Improvement Project, is a collaboration between the Parks and Recreation Department and the Creeks Division. So when we started our park de design and park development project, which is about three years ago, at the same time, the Creeks Division was looking for opportunities to do stormwater treatment systems underground in the city, and Bonnet Park was a perfect place for them to do the work. So as soon as we realized we were working on projects in the same location, we started coordinating and making sure that the timing of our projects could be synced so that we could do it at the same time. So the project that you guys can see a little bit behind us here is a stormwater treatment and park improvement project. So it's two things. Uh, the stormwater treatment is to treat urban runoff from about six acres of the west side neighborhood before this runoff enters Old Mission Creek, which is on our right. For the park improvement projects, we've been working for a couple of years on improving access into and around the park, so improving accessibility of the park. We just recently renovated the restroom there and also building new picnic areas. So one of the things that, uh, as we went through the, this project at the beginning, that was really uh, identified by the community as an important uh, component was the ability to reserve picnic space. It's hard to imagine now with this being a construction site, but these little picnic areas right along the creek here are uh, really quite popular and you'll have people putting up signs or laying down tape very early hours in order to reserve a space for their event. So to have a separate space that's going to be both ADA accessible as well as reservable through the city's website will allow for those must-have events to you know, have the peace of mind that that place is available and reserved for them um, while the sort of drop-in incidental picnic uses can continue. I don't the park and sports field will also be renovated as part of the project. Because so much of the grassy area needs to be excavated, it's giving us the opportunity to actually improve that space as well. Um, so we'll actually have a level playing field, which is something that this park's lacked for a while. It's been slightly slanted toward the creek. 
Stormwater treatment infrastructure was installed under the brand new field, and it's designed to filter stormwater before it enters Old Mission Creek and eventually into the ocean. So behind us, you can see a large pit and in that pit uh, you can see some gravel. We're going to put what we call stormwater chambers in this pit and those chambers are basically they look like half pipes and they will be half pipes that will be laid on top of the gravel right there. The water from two storm drains that comes off of the street and those drain right now directly into Old Mission Creek. We're going to intercept those storm drains and put in a diversion structure at each one of them. They will divert the water from the storm drain into this basin and into those half pipes. They'll fill those pipes up when it rains and then the water in the chambers will slowly infiltrate down into the ground. And then they'll be, they'll be uh, empty and available for the next rain event. After installation, it won't take much to maintain and the project will last decades. The project is designed to take about three to three and a half months to complete. It started in mid-October and was scheduled to end about the first week of January. We've had a few project delays, so it'll probably be a little later, maybe mid-January before the project is completed. The maintenance is inside the chambers themselves. We hope that we don't get any dirt in there, but the diversion structures are designed to capture sediment and trash. And so we'll physically remove the trash out of there and then we get what are called vector trucks to come in and they actually suck out the, the fine, the dirt material from these diversion structures. And we're not sure on the frequency of that. We think maybe a couple times a rainy season we'll have to do that, but again, it remains to be seen. Most of these things we're trying to design for 50 years, hopefully, but we don't know. It depends on if we get a lot of fines, if a lot of dirt gets actually into the infiltration chamber and slows down the infiltration rate, then at that point, you know, it doesn't have the same capacity and it won't treat as much water. But we do have pre-treatment vaults that we will maintain in order to remove that dirt prior to getting down into the filtration basin itself. We'll see how well this works and what kind of infiltration rate we get and how much storm can be treated. I mean, there's a possibility if the infiltration is very good that we can even treat larger rain events. Treating stormwater is important to Mission Creek and its ecosystem because clean water helps ensure the health of the animals that live there. A lot of people don't know that there are fish species that actually live in the creek, even in, in Mission Creek. There's a, an endangered species called the steelhead trout, and there are still are some of those uh, living in the upper watershed. So anything that we do to pollute that harms their environment. That's where they eat and live. And so if we put pollutants into the water, it makes it very hard for them to survive. And then eventually that water goes out into the ocean. And if it's not good water quality, it affects the organisms that live in the ocean. So the main thing we try to do is prevent that pollution from entering the creek channels and ultimately the ocean. Overall, the stormwater improvement project will help the environment and will come along with great park improvements that everyone can come and enjoy. A real win for the city of Santa Barbara and the residents on the west side. For more information on the Bonat Park Stormwater Improvement Project, head to the website santabarbaraca.gov slash Park. We'll be right back. Don't forget your mask when you leave home. Face coverings are required in all public areas. If each of us wears a mask, everyone is protected and we can all move around and enjoy all Santa Barbara has to offer safely. Hello, I'm Henry Thompson, Airport Director at Santa Barbara Airport. First, I'd like to say thank you to the entire Santa Barbara community. Thank you for staying home when you can and taking precautions to help ensure our families, friends, and neighbors stay safe and healthy 
throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. But even during a pandemic, there are those of us that need to fly. So I would also like to thank all of our dedicated airport personnel that have been working tirelessly to ensure every traveler's experience lives up to the highest standards for cleanliness, safety, and comfort. From the custodial staff continually sterilizing surfaces to personnel throughout the airport facilitating appropriate distancing measures and making sure our signature ease of use and welcoming atmosphere never changes. I want to assure you that Santa Barbara Airport continues to take every precaution possible to make sure your experience is safe, easy, and enjoyable. So whenever you're ready to fly, we're ready to welcome you back into the airport and onto your destination. Thank you, and we'll see you back in the air soon. Welcome back. The Las Positas MODOC Multi-Use Path Project is making progress. You'll notice lots of construction in the Las Positas Valley. We'll show you what it takes to keep this project running smoothly. On what used to be State Highway Route 225, the new Las Positas and MODOC Road Multi-Use Path is a huge improvement in safety and peace of mind for pedestrians and cyclists. So this project has been a long time coming. It's been included originally in concept in the 1974 City Bicycle Master Plan, and it's been in two subsequent bicycle master plans after that. It's gotten a lot of community support, you know, mainly from the West Side neighborhoods, the Hidden Valley neighborhoods. The purpose of this project is basically to create a safe path for um, the active transportation users. Whether you're, you're walking or bicycling or running along the multi-use path, it is going to be completely separate from vehicular traffic and uh, will provide just safety for, for all of the users using the path. With the primary objective of eliminating traffic-related injuries by 2025, the multi-use path is a big step towards the city's Vision Zero goal. Some of the improvements include new LED lighting at crosswalks, a new traffic signal, as well as a median with trees and other plantings to divide the space between vehicles and those using the multi-use path. The project was uh, initially funded for design and environmental review back in 2014 through the active transportation uh, program. And then a few years later, we were able to secure construction funding uh, for the project through that same uh, grant source of the active transportation program. The community was really involved just on the onset uh, at various neighborhood workshops. It was really fun. We had it at Monroe Elementary uh, School and their big assembly room. We lined up a bunch of tables and basically showed the entire 2.6 mile route and where residents could gather around uh, the plans. Um, and aerials just to show uh, what issue areas they had. Uh, we really depend upon our residents um, because they're here every day <laughs> driving this uh, stretch of roadway or biking or running. And so they really provided us a lot of insight to go from the concept to final design phase. In addition, uh, the community also uh, participated with our various design um, and review boards with the city. So this project did have a very long uh, entitlement process with respect to the, we've had to go through design review for the Architecture Board of Review, uh, also the Street Tree Advisory Committee and Parks and Rec Commission, the Creeks Com uh, Committee as well, and the Transportation Circulation Committee, and followed by the Planning uh, Commission, um, and then City Council Review as well. And so for all of these various meetings too, we continue to receive great insight, uh, again, to take this from concept to uh, final design. And it was around March of 2020 uh, when the design was finally wrapped up and ready to uh, go out to construction. So in construction, there's a lot of moving parts to this project. It's, uh, it's, this project is approximately 2.6 miles long. 
Um, and so there's a lot of coordination that you have to uh, deal with. I mean, right now we have the waterline project that's happening, you know, also adjacent to our project. So we're trying to make, make sure that the contractor stays on schedule while coordinating with other projects that are happening nearby. Um, we're coordinating with different utilities that are, are moving some of their utilities during construction. So all of that plays a part in trying to, you know, make sure that our construction project is moving efficiently and in a timely manner. Some of the challenges in the planning phase involves like the environmental in order to, to move forward with this project in construction. There were a lot of trees that needed to be removed and mitigated for. There are also some alignment challenges. There's a, a, a lot of steep slopes that we have to maneuver. There's a lot of retaining walls that are being constructed as part of this project. So the topography was, was a challenge. Um, some of the current uh, changes to the stripings that are done right now, it's primarily they're temporary because we are basically trying to provide a safe construction work zone for the contractors to work. There will be, you know, permanent striping changes later on, but the ones that you see currently right now during construction are, are all temporary. Some of those things are being shifted just so that the, the workers are able to work safely um, on Las Positas right now, particularly north of the Cliff Drive roundabout. Because the space there is so tight, the vehicles have to share the road with uh, some of the bicycle users. So they're temporary at this point. Some of the project features that we are going to be including in this, this project, the traffic, uh, new traffic signal that we're um, installing in front of the Ealings Park entrance that's um, intersecting uh, Las Positas Road. There's also, I mentioned the lighting that we're installing at the path crossings. There's also some bioretention basins that we're installing, um, stormwater treatment facilities that it's going to improve stormwater quality. Um, there's medians, retaining walls, there's a lot of features uh, in this project that's going to be constructed. And yeah, I think this is going to be such a big benefit to the community and I'm just very glad that I'm, I'm a part of it. For more information on the MODOC multi-use path project, head to the website santabarbaraca.gov. There's a new non-native invasive mosquito in Santa Barbara County. The species poses a threat to humans, but there are ways to prevent it from breeding. The Mosquito and Vector Management District of Santa Barbara County is dedicated to stopping this invader from calling Santa Barbara its home. The Aedes aegypti, or commonly known as the yellow fever mosquito, was first discovered in the Central Valley of California in 2013, and then again in the Los Angeles area, and since then has been climbing north along the coast and has made its way into Santa Barbara County. Here in Santa Barbara, we've found it in two isolated areas right now. Uh, the first place where we found it was in late September in the area around North Lacumba Road and Foothill Road. So there's a neighborhood there. We've set up traps, we've done inspections. A lot of other mosquitoes will feed on other animals, especially birds but Aedes aegypti really likes humans, so it tends to stay near where humans are, so it doesn't spread as fast as some other mosquitoes might. Uh, then about a month after we found it in that area, we found it in the west side, near Chino Street and Arriaga. And again, very limited space, but it is found there. Uh, we've caught them in traps. We've had residents that have actually caught them and turned them into us. So uh, they're pretty well established in those two areas. Now that the Aedes aegypti mosquito has established itself in Santa Barbara, it's important to know that unlike our native mosquitoes, the Aedes aegypti has the genetic ability to carry and spread diseases. So yellow fever is one of them. Uh, another disease is called chikungunya, which is a, a very debilitating disease. Uh, that makes people you know, very, very sick, uh, causes a lot of problems with uh, joint pain, aches. Uh, it's not usually fatal, but it, it, it's a, people that get it get very, very sick. Uh, another disease that people can get is dengue, and that one has a common name of breakbone fever because your joints ache so much, it feels like your bones are about to break, so it's pretty serious. And then another disease that they can carry is Zika. And some people may have heard about Zika. 
uh, especially when it was in Brazil. There's a large outbreak in Brazil, and one of the dangerous things about the Zika virus is it can cause birth defects. So uh, pregnant women get bit by a mosquito that's infected with the, uh, the virus, uh, they can end up having, uh, giving birth to children that have uh, birth defects. So these are all very serious diseases and we sure don't want them here uh, in Santa Barbara. This mosquito is sometimes referred to as the ankle biter and is also very active during the day, unlike mosquitoes native to California. The really uh, serious problem that they cause besides the disease is they just will affect our, our way of life, our quality of life. Because right now, most of us don't have any problems with mosquitoes when we go outside. So you can imagine, you know, going outside at any time during the day and, and having to worry about getting bit by mosquitoes. However, there are steps that the community can take to control the mosquito population and prevent the females from laying eggs. Really one of the simplest things that people can do around the home is to find sources of stagnant water. So if you have anything in the yard that's filled up with water, you know, buckets, children's toys, uh, anything that can hold water, that's where the mosquitoes lay their eggs. One more thing that makes the Aedes aegypti mosquito different from native mosquitoes is it can breed indoors and it doesn't need much water to do so. Their eggs have been found in things like potted plant saucers, as well as toilet brush holders, toothbrush holders, and even coffee makers. One important note is that none of those diseases that I talked about are present here in California. So we have the mosquitoes that are capable of transmitting the, the disease, but we don't actually have the diseases themselves. So that's a good thing. Uh, we do get what are called uh, travel-related cases of these diseases where people travel to other countries where the diseases are established and they pick up the virus from a mosquito bite there and then when they return to California, they get sick. So that's the concern is that we have these people with the travel-related cases with the virus and then the mosquitoes that are here will feed on those people and start spreading the disease locally. So you want to protect yourself from getting bit, and you can do that by using uh, repellent. Uh, generally, we recommend those that are recommended by the Environmental Protection Agency. So the other thing you can do is to wear long sleeves, long pants when you're outside, which doesn't always uh, make sense if it's in the middle of summer when it's really hot. So repellents are something that are, are really good to protect yourself. Uh, for your house, Make sure that you have screens on your windows. Don't leave your doors open so that the mosquitoes can come in, not only to bite you, but to start laying their eggs in any sources of water that they might find. So all of these things are things that we can do to fight the bite. And that's the message that we want everybody to, to remember is to fight the bite. So, you know, using repellents, getting rid of stagnant water around the house, um, avoiding being outdoors if at all possible. And if you are, you know, use a repellent. If you would like to learn more about the invasive Aedes aegypti mosquito and ways to prevent it from breeding, head to the Mosquito and Vector Management website at mvmdistrict.org. Let's fight the bite. Each year, the City of Santa Barbara's Water Conservation Program honors an individual, business, or organization that goes above and beyond its water conservation efforts. And wait till you see why the Mesa Laundromat is taking the title. Each year, the City of Santa Barbara's Public Works Department Water Resources Division recognizes a business or individual that best reflects the ideals of effective water conservation. This year, the Mesa Laundromat is the City of Santa Barbara's 2020 Water Hero, saving about 24,000 gallons of water a month. That's 285,000 gallons of water a year. This laundromat has been at the Mesa for a little bit more than 25 years. So we purchased the laundromat in January of 2016 and we've been here ever since. Since we took over we've been very welcomed by the Santa Bar city of Santa Barbara and the Mesa. We got great customers who've been coming here for years and everybody's been very very pleasant to work with and we love meeting new people every day and coming in here and telling us how much they enjoy coming into the laundromat.
We actually started looking into the amount of water that we were using in the old washes we had. And uh, we discovered that the amount of water we were using, it was, you know, ridiculous. And we wanted to do something uh, during the drought, especially to do our share and how to save water. And uh, we started looking into new washers and how much water they can save, but still do a good job and keep our customers happy. Maribel and Lalo decided to purchase brand new washers. These water efficient washers use an average of 12 gallons of water per load, which is a huge difference compared to their old washers, which averaged about 60 gallons of water per load. That's a near 50 gallon difference. We actually went into a clean show that it was held in Vegas. I think we went in 2016 and uh, my husband actually sells commercial washers and dryers. And so he's very knowledgeable about the equipment and then how efficient they become. So we started to see what was um, competent with the, with the ones we, were, we had so we can keep our customers still happy and making sure that they still do a great wash. The old washers that we have, um, they were the same brand actually, um, and they were really good machines at the time when, we, when the owner got them. We got the laundromat with those machines, but um, the design of the old washers were designed to hold a lot of water on the bottom of the drum, which is called dead water, which is no usage for it. So every cycle you have dead water on it. The new washers, they have a better design, which eliminates the dead water. So that alone, it saves a lot of gallons of water per cycle. So that's a win right there. And the new machines aren't just water efficient, they're energy efficient as well. Well, definitely we have um, lower or electricity um, as well, because since all the washers have to stay on all day and all night, um, the old washers were pulling in more electricity just to keep them on. And this ones have the technology that um, they can go to sleep. So the screen is not on all the time. So they're not using as much um, electricity. They actually have a uh, motor it's, and they have inverter controls, which it controls the speed of the motor. It just, uh, like the old motors they have, they were huge motors on each washer. This one serves small motors. Uh, drive uh, um, inverter controls, which it makes the motor go faster with the less electricity consumption. So therefore, yes, they come, the laundry comes out almost dry. And so you spend less time on the dryers saving gas as well too. The most challenging part about upgrading our equipment was the first trying to gather the funds to make the correct changes to, um, for the new washers, we wanted to get the highest quality out there with the best technology available to us that uh, we're still gonna do a great performance um, and keep our customers happy. The Mesa Laundromat was able to gather the funds for 17 brand new washing machines in part by participating in the city's WaterWise survey and incentive program. Because the machines were cost-effective water efficiency upgrades, the city worked with Maribel and Lalo to help cover part of the cost. And the machines not only proved to be a benefit to the environment, but to the Mesa laundromat customers as well. The most rewarding part of the process was to see the customers enjoying the new washers. The other one, of course, is to see our water bill go down, not only the water, the sewer, but the electricity as well. And the new looks that they have, I mean, they're just amazing. So people, you know, are so pleased and that's a rewarding part of it. Every single customer that came in was very thankful. One, because new washers, and second of all, is the amount of water we were saving. Every, all of our customers asked, why were we making these changes? And our answer was, the number one is to save water. Um, during the drought, uh, we noticed that water levels were going down and we wanted to do our share, and we felt that this was the best way we could contribute. Congratulations to the owners and staff at the Mesa Laundromat for being this year's water heroes and for their continued commitment to saving water. We want to thank all the customers for their support and loyalty to this laundromat. And we also want to welcome new customers to the laundromat as well. Well, we would love to come up with new ways to save a little bit more water and especially in um, getting better washers. 
Uh, we're looking into definitely um, seeing what's available and what's new and hopefully that we can make more changes to help the city in saving water and electricity and gas. If you would like to learn more about past water heroes, head to the website santabarbaraca.gov slash waterhero. Well, that does it for this episode of Inside Santa Barbara. If you have questions or comments on the show, give City TV a call at 564-5311. Not to worry if you missed anything, you can watch us online at santabarbaraca.gov. I'm your host, Sierra Kalman, and remember, get involved inside Santa Barbara. Thank you.